inspiration for today is how to have an outstanding new year. You know, we have, we talk about new year's resolutions in our culture and it's pretty well universally thought that new year's resolutions are always bound to be a disappointment. We, uh, we get cynical about new year's resolutions. And it seems as though we come to accept grudgingly the fact that each year is pretty much the same as the other, and that you're pretty much a fool. If you imagine that the next year is going to be better than this year, but I want to stand against that. I want to talk about, and I believe our Torah passage gives us wisdom about how to have an outstanding new year so that when you get to this point next year, to this particular Shabbat a year from now, if I came up to you and said, how has the year been? That you would say, Rabbi, it's been outstanding. Now, how, how can this Parsha help us with this uh, endeavor? I will show you. Why bother, for example, with the 10 days of awe, if, uh, if one year is the same as another, why bother with the 10 days of awe? because you want to make the new year more righteous and more rewarding than the previous one. That's a holy responsibility. That's a holy aspiration, a holy ambition to make ourselves and our year even a little more righteous and even a little more rewarding than the year past. Not mediocre, not same old, same old, been there, done that. Well, that's not what we want. Well, in our Pasha, we're equipped for this endeavor, and I want to challenge you to lay aside your cynicism, if you have any. If you don't have any, I'll lend you some of mine. Lay aside your cynicism and look at this provision that our Parsha gives us. It gives us a recipe for success in living a more righteous uh, and rewarding life. And it does that in, in two ways. First of all, it presents a model for us to imitate. And then it presents three hats for us to wear. And you can see those three hats in this illustration. So we're going to be looking at a model for us to imitate and some hats to wear. The model comes to us, um, especially in verse 4 of Deuteronomy 32, where we read these words, Hatsur tamim pa'alo. The rock, his work, I love this. This is just so powerful, so compact. The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are just. A trustworthy God who does no wrong. He is righteous and straight. Sadiq v'yashar. This idea of straight, he's the standard upon which everything else is judged. You know, when they, uh, when they train people to detect counterfeit money, uh, they don't study counterfeit money. They don't study counterfeit money at all. They study real money because it's by acquainting yourself with the real thing that you are able to spot the bogus counterfeit. And similarly, the rock is the standard. God is the standard of righteousness. All his ways are just, a trustworthy God who does no wrong. His work is perfect. He is righteous and he is straight. He is the standard, the gold standard by which everything else is judged. And he is the model for us. We are called to model ourselves after God. That sounds usually presumptuous but really we're made in the image of god we're made to reflect god's nature to reflect his character uh, and uh, the theology speaks of two related concepts one is imago dei the image of god we are to reflect the image of god and the other is imitatio dei which the imitation of god we're supposed to imitate him the Jewish tradition says the same thing. It's, it, it says that uh, we that God clothed the clothed the naked, as in the case of Adam and Eve leaving the garden, He clothed them 
God clothes the naked, we should clothe the naked. God buries the dead, as in the case of Moses, we should bury the dead. God feeds the hungry, we should feed the hungry. The imitation of God is the assumption that underlies Jewish ethics. And we see this perfect portrait, miniature portrait of God in this verse, that he is the rock, his work is perfect, all his ways are just, he's trustworthy, he does no wrong, he is righteous, and he's straight. We judge everything else by him. And uh, Paul the Apostle says the same thing, in other words. He says, we should be imitators of God, as dearly loved children. And we should walk in love, just as the Messiah also loved us and gave himself for us, as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a fragrant aroma. And here we see the the the, the, the Brit Hadashah's assumption that Yeshua is the perfect representation of the image of God. So by being imit by imitating him, we are imitators of God. As we imitate God, we are going to pattern ourselves after the Messiah. This is very important to remember. And there are other verses that make this idea um, more apparent to us. Just hold on a second. Okay, let's just look at this first. There is a wrong model. If we don't imitate God, our Torah text tells us that there's another thing that we can do instead. It says, look, he is not corrupt, but the defect is his children, a crooked and perverted generation, so verse 5 is contrasting the normal depravity of humankind and of human culture. It's crooked. God is straight, but we are crooked. We deviate from the image of God. And that's the wrong model to follow. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, who does not stand in the way of sinners, who does not sit in the seat of the scornful. Blessed is the one who was not crooked, uh, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He's straightened out by the commandments of God and by its portrayal of, of, uh, of Hashem. A little more light on this following the right model, imitating the right model. Paul says, be imitators of me, as I am of Messiah. So now we've got three things to look at. Imitating God, the rock whose way is perfect. We imitate God by imitating Yeshua, who is the perfect representation of the image of God. But Paul says also, to the extent that we know people who themselves are good imitations of the Messiah, good reflections of his nature, thus good reflections of the nature of God, we should imitate them to the extent that they are a clear representation of the holiness of God, the holiness of Yeshua. The letter to the Hebrews says it this way, in these last days, God has spoken to us through a son, whom he appointed the heir of all things and through whom he created the universe. Now watch this, the son is the radiance of his glory and the imprint of his being. That word is like a stamp by which you stamp out coins. He is, he is the, the imprint of, of God's nature. God's nature, like in the clay of human form, God stamped human form in Yeshua with his imprint. Yeshua is the imprint of God's being. And therefore, in imitating God, in trying to live a life that reflects his righteousness, we are to do nothing less than imitate Yeshua. And the alternative, of course, is to walk in the crookedness and perversity of our culture and of our normal tendencies. And Paul's, uh, Paul says in Romans 12, and this is out of the Phillips translation, it's, it's really a brilliant translation of Romans 12 too. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. So contrast that. The world squeezing us into its mold, its values, its perspective, its priorities, either being squeezed into that mold and being shaped by that mold, or being imprinted with the nature of Yeshua. 
That's the choices we have. So I told you that our lesson involves one model, and that model is God himself, and three hats. Let's turn to those three hats. These are hats that God wears in this Torah passage, and he wears often in the Bible. And these are hats that we should wear in the year ahead in order to have a rewarding and righteous life. It says in our our parsha, he found his people in desert country in a howling, wasted wilderness. We also should be people who are finding others that need to know the love of God and need to know the riches that are available to us through Yeshua and the Holy Spirit. Yeshua talks about himself as a finder of people. The Son of Man came to save, to seek. Notice, he's he's come to seek, to find, to seek and to save that which is lost. Yeshua tells his disciples when he first calls them, he says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He teaches about himself. This is after an image in the book of Ezekiel, by the way. He says he's the good shepherd. He goes out and seeks the sheep that is lost. He tells us, uh, pray to the Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers into the harvest. He says at the end of the gospel, he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We should be people who are occupying ourselves with finding people who have begun to be sensitized to the 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 spirit of God, that they're, they're now this doesn't mean buttonholing everybody because that can create negative results. It doesn't mean stuffing papers under their windshield wipers. It doesn't mean stuffing things in their mailboxes. It doesn't mean being being over anxious about witnessing to everybody. That's not what it means. It means having a finder's eyes. It means being on the lookout for people who uh, who you sense uh, may be tilting towards God without even realizing it. We have to have a finder's eyes and have a finder's mind. We need to be finding people uh, who can be brought into the kingdom. I don't have to say more about that. But this is what God, that's God's nature. And if we're going to be in the image of God, we're also going to be finders. We're not passive. We're actively looking for those who need what we know. Secondly, here's the second, the protector's hat. He protected him, that is Israel, and cared for him, guarded him like the pupil of his eye. This, this I, I wasn't aware Uh, or maybe I just forgot, this is the second place in the Bible, in Zechariah it's also true, that God speaks about Israel as the apple of God's eye. That's the same term. It's the pupil of his eye, that when you touch Israel, it's like putting your finger in God's eyeball. It's not a good idea. He protected him and cared for him, guarded him like the pupil of his eye, just as you would not let anybody put put uh, their finger in your eyeball you, you guard your eye from that. So God gu- guides, guards, and, and protects his people. We should be protectors of the vulnerable. We should have a reputation amongst the people who know us that we look out for other people. That doesn't mean we're vigilantes. It doesn't mean that we can solve every problem. But it does mean that we're awake to how people are being misused, disrespected, threatened, um, um, attacked, being how how they're they're denigrated in some way. We should be protectors of people. We should not be indifferent. We should not say, oh, it's not my problem. It is our problem. True religion is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted by the world. We should be protectors of orphans and widows who have no power in the ancient culture. They were were the most vulnerable. We should protect them. So we should be protectors of people in our day. 
sadly, I see a lot of believers who have a list of people who, uh, who they condemn. Um, I think we can do better than that. And finally, the third hat is the provider's hat. They ate the produce of the fields. He had them suck honey from the rocks and olive oil from the crags, curds from the cows and milk from the sheep. You drank sparkling wine. Uh, sorry, you drank sparkling wine from the blood of grapes. The key here is that God provided for Israel in the wilderness. And there are people who are suffering lack. It's not just people who are poor, who don't have something to eat. It's people who are emotionally impoverished, people who are spiritually impoverished, people who are situationally impoverished, people who, who are, are, are one down. We should be people who, who provide for them in some way. We, we feel a, a desire to take care of them in some way. Richard and Marsha both have gifts of mercy. Richard and Marsha cannot walk past a needy person and do nothing. It's not in them. I've known this about Richard and Marsha for 30, 40 years. They have gifts of mercy. They are providers. They, they try to see that people are taken care of. We should be like that too. We should be uh, finders. Let's look at the three hats. We should be finders of, of the lost sheep of the house of Israel in particular. We should be protectors of those who are vulnerable. We should be providers of those who are in some way unjustly impoverished. So for an outstanding year, try this. Remember your model and wear your hats. The finder's hat, the protector's hat, the provider's hat. That's the best I have to say to you today. I hope that it gives you something to think about. Shabbat Shalom and Shana Tova. Thank you.